For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepherd with Mark Sanborn, the author of Up, Down, or Sideways, How to Succeed When Times Are Good, Bad, or In Between. Mark is president of Sanborn & Associates. He's written a number of books, and he's uh, served uh, well over 1,500 clients, including some of America's largest corporations. Mark, it's great to have you on the line today. Thank you, Wayne. Good to be talking with you and those listeners who are familiar with Up, Down, or Sideways. Yeah, this book, did you write this specifically thinking of the malaise that we're in right now? Well, you know, the current malaise and the whiplashing of the stock market was all a clevering, uh, clever marketing opportunity <laughs> that I uh, created. It took a great deal of uh, orchestration on my part. You're the reason for all this. Yeah, no, don't blame me, because <laughs> regrettably, my investments are being whiplashed, and my well-being is being challenged just like everyone else's, but... <laughs> I got to tell you that the uh, lessons that I have learned and started to write about in 2008 during the last Great Recession certainly have proven to be relevant and, and timeless because they're just as applicable now as they were when I started distilling them a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And these lessons are about leadership, right? Well, they're about personal leadership, and, and I certainly work with corporate leaders and organizational leaders to make the application with others. But first and foremost, Up, Down, or Sideways is a book for people who really want to stop playing catch-up. You know, whenever the economy changes, when we're in a boom or a bust or we're going sideways, people tend to use different sets of skills and strategies. And what I learned from personal experience, and, and I'll tell you, Wayne, this is of my many books that I've written, the most personal one, because I disclosed early on uh, kind of the trifecta of challenges I faced in 2008, recovering from cancer surgery, hmm. facing a downturn in my business, and a, a big downturn in, in my finances because of the recession. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write a book that focused on what we should always be doing, not what we should do that is situation-specific. Because I found there were just a, kind of a, a few things, a short list, if you will, of mindsets and methods or ways to think and things to do that if we consistently did them, wouldn't allow us to control the future. Uh, nobody can tell you or I how to do that. But it would mitigate the downsides, and it would help us take advantage of the upsides and, and make the most of those, those sideways periods. Those, these are what I call the regular routines or the daily disciplines that are required to be successful always. Not to win all the time, but in the book, if your readers uh, and listeners today have made it to the end, they'll know that I describe being successful always as doing those things that we know will ultimately benefit us. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily know when, but we operate with a faith and from a lot of anecdotal experience that says when you do those things, they come back to, uh, to to benefit us greatly in the future. Yeah, you stay in the game. I, I mean, even the most successful hitter in the major leagues, you know, barely hits 300 most of the time, right? Well, and that's the key is you don't have to uh, you don't have to have a, a, a visionary insight, become an entrepreneur with the next big hit, but you just have to be doing some things that will protect you against the bad things that, if you live long enough, inevitably happen, and that help you take advantage of the good things that also happen uh, at the same time. Mm -hmm. So how do we avoid, uh, you know, all the winds blowing us from one extreme to the other? I, I mean, you've already given us part of the answer to that, but we've, we've got to just stay, you use the word discipline, that, that's a, a word some people don't like, but people realize that's what has to happen. There has to be discipline in this arena. Well, it's funny you should mention that because I conclude the book with the sixth method, if you will, being to embrace discipline, <clears throat> and I have come to, since I wrote the book, talk about the fact that there's no magic bullet. I think the single biggest obstacle to success in any market condition is the unwillingness to do the work. We, we live in the age of wishful thinking, and it's become popular to think that we can just kind of manifest good things into our life without doing anything to achieve them. And I, I don't want to, to speak down towards, uh, t uh, towards that concept per se, because I do talk about the importance of attitude. But at the end of the day, it's about what you know and do, not just about what you know. And, and when people aren't willing to do the hard work, that's their choice. But I think it's really kind of immature to complain that we don't have what we uh, desire in life when we aren't willing to invest any time or effort to attain it. How do we know, though, when we've reached a true dead end and we should change strategies? 
Well, you know, the old saying is when the horse is dead, dismount. <laughs> uh, the problem is is that sometimes we're not sure the horse is dead. Yeah. I take a little bit different approach. I, I think that most people will have a pretty good sense of when what they're doing isn't working. I, I can't give you a formula, a mathematical equation to conclusively identify that. But what I say is that hope is having something new to try and being willing to try it. I think that in a constantly changing world, one of the most important skills any of us can have is agility. And agility is the ability to, 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 to you know, move around and try new things. Now, let me just clarify, I'm not suggesting we do that instead of the principles that I talk about in the book, but in addition to. You know, for instance, I talk about the importance of producing value, making sure that the people who give you money, whether that's an employer or a client, that though that you know what they value so that you can continue to deliver value to them. Well, if you want to increase the value you deliver to people, you need to keep trying new things. We call it innovation. We call it research. We call it experimentation. So the, the idea that we must continually produce value for those people who we depend on for our livelihood, that's a, a principle that doesn't change. But agility is the ability to do lots of different things to make sure that we're continuing to provide value or even better, create new value for them. This just came up yesterday. I was at a golf outing for an organization, and I sat with a couple of young guys who basically have, I think, maybe a five-man company, a web design company. And I was asking them, you know, how do they get the work done but still, you know, learn all the technologies that changes and how do they remain agile? And, it, you know, it just it comes with the work, and it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, long, hard hours. Well, this isn't a particularly sexy concept, but I often say we do what we need to do. When things are good and we're successful, we have more options to do what we want to do. But I allude uh, in the book to a quote that I believe Zig Ziglar popularized that says, and I'm going to paraphrase it, if you do the things you don't want to do when you don't want to do them, you'll eventually be able to do the things you do want to do when you want to do them. <laughs> and, and I think that that speaks to the, the idea that there, there is an investment that we make before we start uh, enjoying uh, returns, if you will. I want people to go deep in this book, but you have three main sections, see, think, and do. We've talked about uh, bits and pieces of all of those, but just lay those out for us, would you? What, what do we need to see? I think we need to see the challenge. The challenge is we don't control the future. To the degree that you and I can be proactive, we should. But to predict the future is an entirely different matter. Predicting the future is easy. Predicting it correctly is really hard. So I talk about being a presentologist. A presentologist looks at what's going on and is very clear on what they need to be doing. Uh, again, I'm not speaking against anticipating the future. There are some things we can anticipate. But by and large, uh, you know, prognostication and, and, and foreseeing the future are highly overrated. But the problem is, is that we've got to see that forces that are bigger than us affect us. Um, the subprime lending debacle, I, I didn't have anything to do with that, but my real estate investment was affected by it. So well, one of the things that we have to be able to do is, is, is to see that if being in control is the key to, to success, that we're, we're all very limited. But if interacting with circumstances and forces bigger than ourselves and doing what we can do is a way to, to make the most of those situations, then that's what we ought to be doing. So we need to see that we don't control the future, but we do control what we do to mitigate the downsides and take advantage of the mm -hmm. upside. But, of course, uh, this is happening all the while, you know, business moves at the speed of light, right? And so how do you find time to sit and think and strategize and, and plan? Well, I've tried to make it easy by doing the thinking and sitting and planning in, in what I talk about in the book, because the second chapter then says if that's the challenge, you know, that there are forces we don't control that are bigger than us and affect us, what should we do? And the second section is how we should think. And I talk about three things. The scorekeeper's secret is about being clear on what's important to you. Uh, you know, don't try to hang out with the housewives of Beverly Hills. First of all, they're a bad example. <laughs> yeah. Secondly, there's there's a great cost to the uh, to the the trappings of fame and notoriety they enjoy. But more importantly, success is always defined at a personal level. A lot of people I meet have leaned their ladders against the the wrong walls of success, so to speak, and they get to the top of the ladder and they go. Why am I unsatisfied? Why is this so ungratifying? And the answer is because 
they got away from what they truly valued. So the premise of that chapter is how you keep score determines how you play the game. The second way to think is to realize that you have leverage in learning. The world keeps changing. You and I need to keep learning. Most people don't have an agenda for ongoing personal or professional growth and development. Mm-hmm. That's right. So I talk about how it's, it's relatively easy to, to make time to come up with and ingest and learn from new ideas. And that's the leverage that, that the learner always has over those who are unwilling to make time to learn. And finally, I talk about the optimist orientation. I'm a bit of a contrarian in that if, 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 you read or if the listeners have read the book, they know that I don't believe attitude is everything. If I did, then I'd say just have a happy attitude and you'll have a happy <laughs> life. I do believe, though, that attitude is the first thing. And I cite research in the book from neuroscience that basically says we aren't just happy because we're successful, but that, interestingly, happiness predisposes us to achieve more, that there's a a neurological underpinning that says those people who are able to focus on the good and what's right and opportunities and not just on what's wrong and, and, and the pitfalls, that those people who develop a positive mindset achieve and enjoy more than those who don't. And that's the optimist orientation. So the scorekeeping, the learning, and the attitude, those are the three keys to the second section on how and what we should be thinking about. And the third section is do, and, and we've, we've talked about that a little bit. You've got to get in that game, and you've just got to roll up your sleeves and do it. Well, one of the things I talk about in that section is that uh, we often make connections, but we don't always keep them. Uh, social media is more about communicating than it is about connecting. Uh, as we record this, Wayne, I have about 11,000 followers on Twitter. I can assure you that as much as I appreciate their interest in my work and as much as I may be interested in them, we are not close friends. <laughs> uh, you know, the average American has about three close friends. Most of the people we call friends, psychologists say, are more accurately acquaintances. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I've noticed is, is that when times are good, we tend to let a lot of our connections lapse. But when times are bad and we need support or we need business, or we need leads, or we need referrals. Suddenly, those connections that we had let lapse or been inattentive to become important to us, and we try to suddenly rekindle them. I think that really successful people who don't look at others as transactions, but as people who they care for and whom care for them, I think those people don't just create connections. I think they work very hard over time to keep those connections. And in the book, I I talk about my pal Marty, who's a wonderful friend. He's a guy I met through business, but he became a good friend. He he is an asset to my life as a friend. He's an asset to my life as a business partner. Love it. And it's all put in this book, Up, Down, or Sideways, How to Succeed When Times Are Good, Bad, or In Between. Now, Mark, the very things that you write about in this book, these, these are the lessons that you've brought to all these corporations that you've served, right? You bet. I often speak to large audiences. That's what I primarily do when I'm not writing books. Uh, I did uh, come out of sales and marketing. I I have operated my own business for going on 25 years. So I'm a a practitioner of what I teach, uh, both in leadership and business development and exceptional performance. But basically, what I try to do is, is, because I know, and you alluded to this earlier, people are busy. They're raising families they're putting out fires, they're paying mortgages, they're running businesses, managing others. I try to distill what I have learned, and more importantly, I think, or as importantly, what other successful people that I've worked with have learned, so that I can kind of shorten that learning curve. I I, I certainly owe a debt of gratitude to the many authors and thinkers that I've learned from and who made my life easier because they shared their insights. And that's what I try to do in this book. Yeah. Well, you've uh, made it a little easier for us by sharing your insights and advice as well. Mark Sanborn, the book is Up, Down, or Sideways, published by Tyndale in print and by Oasis Audio in audio book form. Mark, thanks for your time today. My pleasure. All the best. And Mark has a website you'll find interesting. It's marksanborn.com. For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepherd.